Live from WTVO Rockford and your home team, Eyewitness News at 5 starts now. Rockford police will debut some new gear added to the, their uniform this month. The community has an opportunity to learn more about the body-worn cameras. We'll explain how you can attend. I'm glad I wasn't here because I might have had a heart attack. A recent accident sent a car crashing into a home. The woman who lives there tells us she's grateful she wasn't home at the time, but something needs to be done to prevent it from happening again. Good evening, I'm Alexis Carpello. Gunshots rang out killing a woman in Rockford earlier today. Police were sent to Lori Drive near Rockford Lutheran School. They tweeted about the scene around 1230 this afternoon. Investigators found a 36-year-old woman with life-threatening injuries. She was taken to the hospital and died. Police haven't shared any details on a potential suspect yet. Rockford police officers are gearing up to add body camera to their uniform. On Monday, October 25th, officers will begin using body cameras regularly. The men and women of the force were trained for more than 600 hours on the new equipment. Now they're inviting the public to come learn more about the cameras. They're hosting three community information sessions. If you take a look at your screen, that's where and when the meetings will be held. For all the dates and times, head to our website, mystateline.com. A recent accident in Belvedere sent a vehicle crashing into a home. It happened near the intersection of Squaw Prairie and Poplar Grove Roads. Rachel Perry caught up with the homeowner today, and Rachel, she tells you she's grateful she wasn't home at the time. Alexa, she tells me a car missed a stop sign at an intersection near her home, leading another car to crash into her house. Now she tells me she's afraid this is going to keep happening. And I looked up and seen, I said, oh, that's my house. Marilyn Hunt tells me she's lucky she wasn't home Friday, but is now left with a major hole in her house after a car crashed into it. And when you pulled up and saw it, what did you, what was your reaction? Oh, it was terrible. I'm glad I wasn't here in the house because I might have been killed, you know, if I'd have been sitting in there when that car come in. Hunt lives on the corner of Poplar Grove Road and Squaw Prairie Road in Belvedere. She says this isn't the first car to drive up her lawn. There is four that have been in my yard, and the one of the four is end of the house, and the other three was in the yard. Her neighbor Pamela Gustafson has lived across the street for nearly 50 years. She tells me the intersection is dangerous and she's brought her concerns to the county board. And what are those concerns that you bring to them? What do you tell them? What is that presentation? Just the whole thing, the whole thing and how, you know, what's, what's happened and, you know, are we going to wait until somebody, till Marilyn or I are killed? I've said that to them. Hunt and Gustafson are asking people to slow down. I think they could start with lowering the speed. If it was lowered to 45, then they wouldn't be maybe going 70. They tell me a huge issue is the amount of people ignoring the stop signs. We have a lot of slow, slow and goes on Squaw Prairie in both directions. And pay attention to the rules. That's the whole thing. And they could put a four-way stop here. It definitely needs one. Hunt tells me she's now nervous to mow her lawn or sit out front her house. Both women say they just want to see people slow down and stop at the signs. Alexis? All right, thanks, Rachel. Stateline residents are taking the extra step to help fundraise for a good cause. Today, people showed up to show their support for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. The event is called Walk for Wishes. Cities across the state participated in the event today. Those there pounded the pavement at Rock Valley College. Isaac helped lead today's walk with our morning anchor, Whitney Martin, before he prepares for surgery tomorrow. Seeing him today, it's, it's the same thing I've seen in the five years uh, that I've been doing this, is, is just uh, the impact that it can have, the hope that it can bring to not only the kids who are suffering, but the families. I think that's another element of it that some people don't think about. The walk is the foundation's biggest fundraiser. If you'd like to donate, you can find this link in this article at mystateline.com. More steps were taken in a virtual walk that's been hosted for decades. The effort takes a step at ending hunger in our community. The 35th annual Rockford Area Crop Hunger Walk is the goal was to raise $45,000. That money will help support local hunger programs. Organizers say this walk is important now more than ever. The crop walk has grown to support uh, 
the issues of hunger around the world, beginning right here in our greater Rockford area. People completed today's walk at their own pace. According to police, a gang blamed for kidnapping five priests and two nuns earlier this year in Haiti is now accused of kidnapping missionaries from a U.S.-based organization. Ike Ajachi shares that 16 Americans and one Canadian were among those kidnapped, five of them children. According to a voice message from Ohio-based Christian Aid Ministries that was sent to other religious missions, a group of 19 missionaries that included a two-year-old child was kidnapped. Police in Haiti say the 400 Mawozo gang carried out the kidnapping in Ganthier, a commune east of the capital of Port-au-Prince. The group was returning home Saturday after building an orphanage. The message goes on to say the mission's field director is working with the U.S. Embassy. The State Department issuing a statement saying the welfare and safety of U.S. citizens abroad is one of the highest priorities of the Department of State. Haiti has faced several difficult challenges this year, including the assassination of President Jovenel Moise in July and a 7.2 magnitude earthquake this past August that killed more than 2,000 people. So you put the poverty uh, on top of uh, repeated 7.0 plus magnitude earthquakes over the years and it's just been brutal for the, for the Haitian people and very difficult for them to establish not just the rule of law but basic functions of society. The country has seen an alarming surge in gang-related kidnappings. Haiti's Center for Analysis and Research and Human Rights reports there have been 600 kidnappings this year, 117 of them in just the last month. There are very few people that are able to, uh, to pay hostage ransoms. And so the Americans make, make a nice target in the sense that they can probably afford to pay. This growing turmoil in Haiti can make it more complicated for the Biden administration to turn away Haitian migrants at the southern U.S. border, many making the argument it is not safe on the ground in Haiti. Ike Jachi, ABC News, Washington. The House Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol plans to seek a criminal contempt referral for former President Trump's staffer, Steve Bannon. Washington correspondent Rashad Hudson shares more as he's keeping you connected to the nation's capital. Good evening. The January 6th Select Committee could soon take a vote to lock up former President Trump staffer Steve Bannon for failure to help in their investigation. He just simply blew us off. Uh, you can't do that. California Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren says Congress has the legal right to issue subpoenas to help in their investigation. There was a, a lead up. Uh, there was coordination. We can already see that. And there was a point to this. Lofgren says the committee has one goal, to get to the bottom of what happened on January 6th and to make sure it never happens again. The democracy is at risk from people who would like to overturn the Constitution. Illinois Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger, who sits on the committee, has this message for other witnesses who refuse to comply. Don't think that you're going to be able to just kind of walk away and we're going to forget about you or not. Kinzinger doesn't rule out that the committee could call former President Trump in for questioning. That's not necessarily something we want to do up front, uh, but if he has pieces of information we need, we, we certainly will. Former President Trump claims the information the committee wants is protected by executive privilege, but President Biden isn't blocking the subpoenas. I hope that the committee goes after them and uh, holds them accountable. On Tuesday, the committee will vote on a criminal contempt referral. If it passes, it then goes before the full House for a vote. Reporting in Washington, Rashad Hudson, back to you. First warned weather forecast from Chief Meteorologist Candace King. Lots of sunshine out there for us this afternoon. A live look at the Mercy House Sky Track camera now out over downtown Rockford. Looking up to the north, one of my favorite views as we look up the Rock River with the trees, the color starting to show a little more with some of these cooler nights and cooler afternoons. It's been cooler today, but actually we've still been above average. Temperatures climbing into the mid and upper 60s. Those numbers now at 66 in Rockford, Jane. 64 in Rochelle, 65 in the Pretzel City, and 64 right now, our number in Monroe. 66 for our weather watcher, Ben in South Beloit. That low dew point temperature, so lots of dry air helping to keep us with that mostly sunny sky. 62, Ken says he's had sunshine all afternoon, and that dew point number also dropping into the upper 30s. That means tonight will be another cool night. Not quite as cold as what we woke up to this morning, although these numbers more typical of where we should be mid October. 
Woke up to a temperature of 35 in Rockford, 36 in Janesville. Rochelle, you got down to 32 degrees. It was cold this weekend, and it felt cold to compared to where it's been the last two weeks. That's because we've been unseasonably warm. If we look at our overnight low temperatures, we have had many nights here where our numbers have been in the mid and upper 60s and 50s, still about 15, 20 degrees above that overnight low. So our temperatures this weekend, while well, where we should be, felt a little more chilly. Now we are going to see those numbers climb a bit here as we go through the next couple of days as we start to bring in a bit more sunshine and we bring those overnight low temperatures up too. But I wanted to talk a little bit about our last freeze. Typically within the first week to week and a half is when we usually see that first freeze occur. Temperatures getting down near 32 this weekend. The first time we really had a lot more of that widespread across the region. region uh, reason being our first freeze is actually coming later and later and later if we look back over the last 15, uh, 50 years I should say. So much so that since 1970 our first freeze here in Rockford 15 days later than what it was 50 years ago. So as our climate continues to warm, we feel the effects of that more so here locally with those overnight low temperatures. And yes, while our high, uh, high temperatures during the afternoon have also been climbing, our low temperatures have actually been warming at a steadier pace and our winter months actually warming faster than any other season. Our temperatures are going to warm the next several days. Big ridge of high pressure here over much of the country. We'll keep that dry air in place. I want to show you that dry air. We've got that here looking at kind of the moisture that we have in the atmosphere. So the purple you see areas that have low amounts of moisture. A little bit of blue kind of working up. That's ahead of our next low pressure system that'll bring us a chance for rainfall by midweek, but still we stay with those dry conditions, which, me which means comfortable weather here for the next couple of days. High pressure in control for us through the afternoon. Tomorrow we see plenty of sunshine, just a little more cloud cover moving in Monday into Tuesday. Not really going to do much for us. In fact, we'll stay dry Tuesday. Temperatures are back into the 70s. Here's our next storm system developing east of the Rockies. That's what will come in late in the day on Wednesday and give us our chance for rain once we had Wednesday night into Thursday. Might even hear a clap of thunder with that, but I don't think the rainfall here is going to be that much. 73 for tomorrow. Same thing on Tuesday. 69 for Wednesday. Look at those numbers, Alexis. Cold front comes in brings us down into the 50s for the upcoming weekend, but right now looks like it's short-lived because by next week we'll likely see those numbers climb once again. Well, now the Napleton Sports Desk with David Greenberg. One of the most storied rivalries in all of sports, the Bears and the Packers. Today, their first of two matchups on the year. Justin Fields getting his first taste of what this rivalry is all about at home and what a start it was for the Bears on their opening drive, capped off by a Khalil Herbert one-yard rushing touchdown. In the second, Packers at the one, little read option shovel pass to Alan Lazard to tie things up at seven. Second half now, Packers at the 12, Rodgers has time, dumps it on a check down to Aaron Jones, he slips a tackler and dives his way in to put the Packers up 17 to 7. Very slow second half for the Bears, but they finally pulled within a field goal in the fourth as Fields finds Darnell Mooney wide open for the touchdown. All the Bears need to do is stop the Packers or hold them to a field goal to give themselves a chance. Easier said than done. Aaron Rodgers, though, reminds him with a little, I own you, as he rushes in to put the Packers up 10. Matt Nagy falls to 1-6 and six in his career against Green Bay as the Bears lose 24-14. Scott Lever was in Chicago this afternoon. He has more on this one from Soldier Field. If this was Aaron Rodgers' last dance here as a Green Bay Packer, well, it was another victory dance. He threw two touchdown passes, ran for a third, did not turn the ball over, and he's now 11-3 against the Bears here at Soldier Field in his career. As for Justin Fields, he's just another quarterback in a long line of Bears quarterbacks who have suffered a loss at the hands of the future Hall of Famer. I think I should have played better. Um, I didn't play as well as I wanted to. Um, you know, I think the drive before the second half ended, I think we should have got points right there, so that's on me. And, I mean, I just got to play better for my teammates. Like I said, we gave, us, gave ourselves the opportunity to win the game, and uh, we didn't. We, um, we got to be able to, you know, um, put points on the board. The defense played, played well, enough for us to win the game. Being able to not pull this out and lose, that, that, that hurts. Division game, just like we talk about when we win, 
Um, same thing when you lose, you got to understand why. You know, the biggest thing for all of us is to understand, like we just talked about in that locker room, is make sure that we, we look at ourselves um, after every loss, just like the wins, and, uh, you know, regroup. The Packers have won 10 of the last 11 meetings with the Bears and 23 of the last 28 games here at Soldier Field. And now the Bears go from playing one future Hall of Fame quarterback to another next week in Tom Brady down in Tampa. In Soldier Field, I'm Scott Leber. Tough road for the Bears ahead. Thanks, Scott. James Robinson had only been a part of one win in his Jacksonville Jaguars career, their last coming over a year ago on September 13th. Since then, 20 straight losses. This morning across the pond, the streak finally came to an end. Jaguars offense has been turning around, and I think we have, to th I think we have James Robinson to thank for that. Another great game from the Rockford native today. 17 carries for 73 yards. This long one there down at the one. And they go back to him for the touchdown. The Jags go to London and come back with their first win in over 13 months, beating the Dolphins 23-20. to That's it for sports. We'll be right back. Stay clear for us tonight. Our first warning interactive radar brought to us by Rockford Auto Glass and More. It'll be another chilly night. Winds will stay on the lighter side after a bit of a breeze we had today from the north and northwest. High temperatures will make it into the uh, lower 70s for tomorrow afternoon, right around 73 degrees. That's after starting off with numbers around 40. We're in the low 70s once again for Tuesday, 60s by the end of the week. Well, thanks for making us your home team. We'll see you at 10.